Okay, we can start. So uh, my lecture is going to be about uh, the politics of trauma, or the political meaning and importance and uses of trauma narratives for um, uh, related to war experiences. Uh, stories about soldiers who suffer mental trauma are usually viewed as anti-war. The publication tends to undermine public support for war and they are more readily associated with unjust and unpopular wars than with just ones. For example, in Israel, trauma narratives are more readily associated with the Yom Kippur War and the Lebanon War than they are with the Six Days War. Similarly, in the United States, they are more readily associated with the Vietnam War than with the Second World War. Supporters of a particular war, for example Vietnam, go to great lengths to suppress trauma narratives or to argue that they are exaggerated and that they receive too much attention. This stands in sharp contrast to stories about physical injury and physical death, which may well be militaristic, pro-war, and drum up support for war in the tradition of dolce decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Compare, for example, the following two images. On the right, we have Tom Lee's famous painting, The 2000 Yard Stair, from 1944, which is one of the most famous paintings to come out of the Second World War. Focusing on the mental disintegration of a man in combat, it is most often interpreted as an anti-war painting uncovering the ugly and unheroic side of warfare. On the left, you have the most famous painting of the Seven Years' War, The Death of General Wolfe by Benjamin West. It shows the death of General James Wolfe at the moment of victory in the Battle of Quebec in 1759. Focusing on the physical disintegration of a man in combat, it is most often in interpreted as a pro-war painting depicting war as heroic and glorious. When we move to photographs, we encounter the same phenomenon. On the right, we have one of the more famous photographs of the First World War, taken during the 1917 Battle of, Third Battle of Ypres. The soldier on the bottom left has the thousand-yard stare, usually associated with combat trauma. The photograph as a whole is usually interpreted as an anti-war photograph which decorates many books and articles arguing that the First World War was a bad and unnecessary and unjust war. On the left, we have probably the most famous, at least positive, icon from the Second Lebanon War in Israel. It shows a wounded Israeli officer, Tomer Buadana, making a V sign with his hand as he is rushed to hospital. So whereas images of physical injury and even death can be heroic and often become positive symbols of war, images of mental injury are never heroic and are usually seen as negative symbols of war. To put, to put the argument of this paper in a nutshell, I would say that people throughout history have argued that it is good and fitting and sweet to die for one's country, but nobody has ever argued that it is good and fitting to lose one's mind for one's country. How can we account for this difference? Why do, why do mental traumas and mental injuries have such a strong connection to negative evaluation of war? There are two possibilities which will be explored in this uh, paper. One possibility is that whereas all wars cause bodily injury and death, regardless of whether they are just or unjust, soldiers suffer more mental trauma when they are fighting in unjust wars. Hence, the mere occurrence of trauma among soldiers is an indication that the war is probably unjust. Some psychological theories of combat trauma tend to support and uphold this line of argument. According to mainly cognitivist theories of trauma, trauma is caused by cognitive dissonance, and unjust wars cause, tend to cause more cognitive dissonance among soldiers, thereby leading to more trauma. The argument goes something like this. People construct complicated mental images of the world in their heads, which they carry around. 
Whatever happens to them, they interpret using these mental maps. When something does not fit the mental map, they usually try to ignore or to suppress it. If it cannot be ignored or suppressed, and if they have enough time and mental resources and energy, they will change their mental map. If, however, they don't have the time or the resources or the energy, and the gap between the mental map and the reality they encounter is too big, the result is mental breakdown. So this is cognitive dissonance theory of uh, trauma. This applies to soldiers in war. Soldiers enter war with a mental map of the war which usually depicts it in rosy colors. Soldiers know that they might, that they might suffer physical hardship, injury, and even death, but it is all done in a just cause. And so even injury and death have a positive meaning of worthy sacrifice. If the aim of the war is indeed justified, and if the army acts in a relatively ethical manner, the soldier's mental map remains solid and they are able to endure much hardship without breaking down. This is because they can give positive meaning to the suffering that they endure and also to the suffering that they inflict. If, however, the soldiers discover during war that their side is fighting for an unjust cause, or that their side is committing too many atrocities, they often do not have the time and the mental resources to readjust their mental, their mental map and they break down. Alternatively, they might come to the conclusion that the war is unjust, but since they cannot leave the army at will, they are forced to go on fighting without being able to give any positive meaning to the suffering that they endure and inflict. The result is again mental breakdown. Very, it is very important to note that this interpretation does not rely on the existence of some absolute morality, only on relative morality. A Nazi soldier indoctrinated to see Jews as enemies of humanity, which must, must be exterminated for the greater good of mankind, will not suffer any trauma upon seeing mass extermination of Jews because he suffers no cognitive dissonance. Similarly, a crusader knight brought up from childhood to believe that killing heretics and infidels is good will not suffer any, any trauma if he massacres the civilian population of a Muslim city. However, an American soldier brought up on a diet of humanistic values who goes to Vietnam believing that America is there to help the Vietnamese may well suffer trauma if he witnesses his unit massacring a Vietnamese village. So the first possibility is that wars which are unjust according to the values of a particular culture will cause members of that culture more trauma. And the appearance of trauma is therefore a real sign that the war is unjust. However, there is another possibility. The second possibility is that justness of war has very little to do with combat trauma, very little influence on the uh, levels of trauma soldiers experience. It is mainly the conditions of service and the intensity of fighting rather than the justness of the war and the values of the culture that determines how, man, how many soldiers will suffer trauma. A short and successful war will tend to cause less trauma than, than a long and difficult war, irrespective of what people may think about their justness. Soviet soldiers, for example, were far less likely to suffer trauma in the invasion of Hungary in 1956, arguably an unjust war, than in their defense of the Soviet Union in the Second World War. Israeli soldiers were less likely to suffer trauma in the Second Lebanon War than in the War of Independence, not because of differences in justness, simply because the war was, was far less intense. Trauma nar narratives are nevertheless associated more often with unjust wars because they are given, given more publicity in such contexts, whereas they are suppressed in the context of just wars. In many cultures, the story of the just war, just war 
tells how some spiritual ideal, whether it's national, religious, social, or ideological, inspires people to make a sacrifice for its sake. The ideal cannot protect the soldiers from physical harm, but the inspiration and guidance it provides are supposed to protect them from mental and spiritual harm. Indeed, as long as the combatants follow the ideal closely, their spirits are supposed to be elevated and purified. Whether it is crusade, jihad, national liberation, or revolution, the armed struggle promises spiritual redemption. Narratives of physical death and even uh, not, sorry, narratives of physical injury and even death are easily squared with this story of the just war. If the crusader loses limbs and even life, the crusade itself might still be viewed positively because the crusader's spirit was redeemed. Indeed, the very fact that the crusader was willing to sacrifice his health, his limbs, and his life is often cited as proof of the worthiness of the ideal for which he was fighting and of the justness of the war. A common argument is that if people are willing to sacrifice their life for this ideal, this ideal must be true. This is why many of the most heroic images of war and revolution depict the injury or death of a willing martyr who redeems his spirit through physical sacrifice. So, a few more examples. Here we see a medieval example, the death of Roland, uh, the knight Roland, who, is di who died fighting the Muslims at the Battle of Roncevoon. He is shown as a Christian martyr. His head is covered by a halo of a saint, and angels are welcoming his soul to heaven. This is a humanistic um, example. Uh, Peter Paul Rubens uh, painting Mucius Scavola before Porcena. The story behind this particular painting is particularly interesting. It is based on a story told by the Roman historian Titus Livius about Scavola, a famous Roman hero from the early ages of the Republic. When Rome was besieged by the superior forces of the Etruscan king Porcina, Scavola infiltrated into the Etruscan camp to assassinate King Porcina. But he was caught and threatened with torture and death if he did not disclose his accomplices. Livius writes that Scavula said to Porcina, and this is a direct quote from Livius, see here that you may understand how, of how little account the body is to those who have great glory in view. And immediately he thrust his right hand into the fire that was lighted for the sacrifice. When he allowed it to burn, as if his spirit was quite insensible to any feeling of pain, the king, well nigh astounded at this surprising sight, leaped from his seat and commanded the young men to be removed from the altar. According to Livius, Porcena was so impressed and frightened by this display of Roman heroism that he not only allowed Scavula to go back to Rome safely, but he made peace with the Romans. Uh, Roman admiration for Scavula's heroics uh, has its, its equivalent today. Uh, on the right, we have a Buddhist monk setting himself on fire uh, in protest against the authoritarian regime in Vietnam in 1963. And on the left, a protester from Mauritania just from two weeks ago setting himself on fire in protest against the government there. Both are seen as courageous and worthy sacrifices, proof that the cause is just and right. A final example from the Spanish Civil War, a very famous one, The Falling Soldier by uh, Robert Capa, it supposedly shows a Republican soldier at the moment he's being killed in battle during the Spanish Civil War. It is usually interpreted as a pro-war photograph idealizing the self-sacrifice and the just cause of the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War.
Now, women's narratives of physical injury and death can be greased to the mill of the war propaganda. Narratives of mental injury and trauma cannot, be, cannot do so and cannot be squared with the story of the just war. If the crusader's spirit is broken and maimed, or if he is no longer willing to make a sacrifice for the cause, can this be redemption? There are only two ways to account for such breakdowns. One is to argue that the faith of this particular crusader or soldier and his ad adherence to the ideals are faulty or faltering. The other is to argue that the ideal itself was chimerical in the first place. What kind of ideal cannot protect its adherents and disciples from mental and spiritual breakdown? In other case, this casts a huge doubt over the justness of the war, for either the cause was unjust to begin with, or the army undertaking this war has abandoned the, the writer's path. Consequ consequently, even, even though there is no real connection between individual trauma and the justness of war, war leaders and war supporters and war propaganda will do everything in their power to suppress and deny trauma narratives. According to this approach, though people associate trauma narratives with unjust war, this association has no empirical basis. Images and stories of happy soldiers in high spirits do not prove that the war is just. Images and stories of traumatized soldiers do not prove that the war is unjust or unnecessary. Such images and stories ten, tell only about the particular situation of a particular soldiers and are devoid of any political importance. More generally, it means that we cannot argue from individual trauma to collective guilt. For instance, the trauma suffered by many American soldiers in Vietnam proves only that it was a difficult war. It does not prove that the war was unjust. Uh, to summarize, the aim of this paper has been to highlight two alternative explanations to the widespread association of trauma narratives with unjust wars. One is that there is a real causal connection between unjust wars and trauma, at least unjust wars as seen by the relative values of that particular culture. And the other is that there is no causal, con causal connection between the two. Trauma narratives are simply suppressed uh, when people think that this is j just war because it's how to square the two together. Uh, it is left to future research to determine which of the two options, if any, is the uh, better one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it was very interesting to see the psychology of war through the eyes of the trauma of the soldiers. And now uh, it's my pleasure to invite to the podium Excuse me? Do we have time? Okay. So please, if we have some questions. Sorry. Please. Do you have a question that might create especially the first part for kind of cynical soldiers who go into work for a financial gain or just because they have legally they have no choice? How does that uh, Financial gain is also a kind of uh, just, just war theory. I mean, just in terms of the individual going into war. It's, it's worthwhile for me to go to war. As long as I think it's worthwhile, I'm not supposed to be in trauma. I get, I get from war what I want to get from it. Um, when there is coercion, it's more difficult, but it's, it is almost impossible to hold an army together and to wage a war only by coercion. You must have some kind of uh, carrots or some kind of positive meaning because you just can't put a, a police officer over every soldier to make sure that, that he is fighting. And at least historically, even 
what we considered the most unjust wars in history, they're very often fought by people who are some, somehow motivated to think that they are, uh, there is some positive meaning in them. Bakasha. capabilities in, in battle. Regarding the other point, yes, the so Second World War is considered a just war, and therefore there are far fewer such photos and paintings and, and stories about this war than about the, sec the First World War or about the Vietnam War. And what also happens is that as the war is revisited and revisioned, and the more you tend to think about, well, maybe it wasn't so just after all, the more space there is for trauma narratives. And maybe it's, it relates to what Professor Lieblich talked about earlier, about why uh, another ex possible explanation of why there is much more talk about trauma in Israel today than there was 20 or 30 years ago. Because as people are revisiting and revisioning their views of past war, even wars which were originally supposed to be completely just, such as the Six Days War, they are more willing to hear trauma narratives connected with, this, with these wars. Just as a comment, they're more willing to see their own behavior as being the result of war, not just their uh, character, like uh, people going from the independence war in Israel, coming back home and uh, being violent towards their children, seeing that behavior as a possible reaction to war, not necessarily them being violent towards their children. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Is, is left to, to recount the, the stories. It's, it's an interesting suggestion whether it can go the other way around. Um, as far as I can think, there are very few wars which were considered unjust in, at the time, and later on people started thinking, well, actually, it was quite just. I mean, it's, I, there is no example that, that springs to my mind. If somebody can think about such an example, it can be a very interesting issue to, to look at. But the Civil War, like um, the American Civil War, where in the North 
gained the racism aspect further on. We don't know if it would help individuals or I mean, it had like a different motivation to begin with and then kind of a more idealistic motivation by the time it ended and in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Well, it is possible that something that at the time was considered unjust or unnecessary and people had to face trauma thinking that they lost say, their limbs for nothing or for even for, for, for a bad thing and afterwards they get this huge hug from society that actually you did a wonderful thing and you're uh, fighting for, for, some, for a just cause, I would think that it, it could really help people to get out of trauma if it, were, would ha if it were to happen. I just can't think of any example at the moment. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. We'll continue. But later in the discussion you can make your uh, points.